Live on the internet soon. We're live on the internet now. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to introduce Hugh Newman, fellow Avalon Rising conspirator, author, and traveler, and researcher into ancient cultures and earth energies. And Jeff Stray, also a Mayan uh, researcher and author who's written many books beyond 2012 and 2012 in your pocket. So please give it up for Hugh and Jeff, the 2012 brothers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, um, so today we're going to be exploring diff various different areas of research that me and Jeff have been independently looking into over the last decade, or for you probably a little bit longer. Um, and our kind of research has kind of come together eventually. It's just sort of quite, you know, we sort of hang out together as well, so it's quite easy. We're really looking at the origins of this Mayan calendar that ends in December the 21st, 2012. I mean, everyone's kind of talking about 2012, especially Jeff. Uh, amongst others, and um, and so we, I've always I'm always questioning what is going on with the origins of the calendar, and uh, and this kind of grew and grew this interest in it. So I started exploring it myself and went to Mexico a couple of times and Guatemala and other places, and realised uh, that the origins of the uh, <laughs> some hairy bits. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Was that a bit of your moustache that got away or something? <laughs> but anyway, so the, the origins of the calendar have really fascinated me. So, And uh, I realised when I went to Mexico, I did a bit of research and started travelling, that the origins aren't necessarily Mayan, which most people assume they are because of the Mayan prophecies, because of the famous uh, 2012 end date. But the origin of the calendar obviously starts in 3114 BC, arguably, although this, this has been debated. Um, and so I'm interested in that kind of era and you know and leading up to it and where the origins may have came from and Jeff's obviously been researching the end of the calendar in 2012 so we thought we'd put our heads together and give a brief kind of um, rough outline of some of the latest research on that that's been discovered and the implications of that really because it's great to know where we're going with I mean 2012 the end date is next year and there's a lot of lot of talk about what is really going to happen and so let, why don't, I wanted to have a look back at that era and find out what was going on then, really, and unlock it from a different perspective and see if that has got any relevance looking at 2012 and this, these certain calendars today. So we've got, we get quite technical with some of the research. Um, so bear with us. And uh, if you've got any questions, just stick your hand up or shout or, or anything. Um, and, uh, and we can open it up for discussion during the talk, after the talk, whatever. We can't actually see anything. It's a bit so. bright, yeah, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, so these are just some images uh, that I put together. Um, this is the Olmec, um, one of the heads in of the Gulf Coast of Mexico. This is the Atlanteans that are at a place called Tula, which is not that far from Mexico City. That's an image of Quetzalcoatl, who we'll be talking about throughout the talk and uh, his relationship potentially to these calendars. This is a famous, uh, that's now been destroyed, carving from Tikal. And this is obviously the area we're going to be looking at. So. Um, We'll, uh, we'll, we'll have to get started, I guess. But Jeff decided to put these in, um, these other pictures, just because he, um, <laughs> he, he thinks it's just actually my holiday snaps, which is obviously not true. We were sat on top of the Hellstone here. This is part of the Megalithomania tour of the fantastic conference that Hugh organises every year. Brilliant conference. Okay. And uh, he just took his uh, socks off there to show off the uh, colourful effect, but uh, they also had, had other effects. <laughs> he, 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 he put that in as well. I didn't know about this. All right. Uh, that was taken at the very first, well, arguably the very first sunrise, which was, uh, yeah, I think it wasn't really a sunrise, but it was a pre-sunrise, wasn't it? Is the, it the Venus Transit Festival? The Venus Transit yeah. Festival, <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed that. Thank you. Uh, that's the highlight of the talk. Uh, that's not, it's just the effect me and Jeff obviously have on each other. We create orbs out of our heads, um, etc. But anyway, uh, back to business. This is some of the bits and bobs we're going to be looking at. So, um, you know, fundamentally, we're going to look, blast through some of the Olmec sites 
uh, questioning the calendar origins about this, this 3114 BC date, which is fascinating because that's when the pyramids started to get built in Egypt. It's also when the, the megalithic revolution was taken about around the entire planet. Although most Mayan scholars believe um, it was actually formed around 100 BC to 100 AD by the Azarpan cultures in the Maya lands, and they projected the date back to 3114 BC, but why would they do that? So we'll, uh, we'll have a look at that question uh, as we go through. Jeff's gonna get really into the calendars so you get some understanding of the calendars. Uh, and lots of serpent symbolism tends to come up uh, when we start looking at these sites, uh, especially with the Quetzalcoatl legends uh, and more. And uh, the connections with Egypt. Uh, Jeff's gonna give an outline of the Tortuguero monument, which is basically the only stone uh, carving that has the actual 2012 end date on it. Um, and again, we're going to look at the origins and uh, throw, open, throw it open to the audience. So as, um, as we know, the Maya lands is what most people know about Mexico. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Jeff just for a little bit here. Go. What, 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 what about? <laughs> I'm new to this. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what do you want me to do? Basically, uh, talk about the, the origins of the Maya. Uh, they don't actually officially go back to 3114 BC when the calendar, uh, the, the 13 Bacton cycle, as we call it, of the long count calendar, is uh, the cycle that ends in 2012. It started in 3114 BC, yet, uh, according to the, the official Mayanist position, the, the academia, um, the, there were no Maya around at that time. So they, uh, they're they have always been saying that like the way that we uh, have dealt with our calendar, we backdated it to a, a, a mythological start point where Jesus was uh, born. But of course, the, our calendar didn't start when Jesus was born. It started, um, when did it start? <laughs> uh, after he was born. Who cares? Our calendar is not very interesting. <laughs> But so potentially there could be a connection with, uh, you know, if that's if that's so, then there could be a connection with the legends of Quetzalcoatl, which it was the plumed serpent or the feathered serpent, which is a legend that was going on in, in, in deep prehistory, going through every, almost every culture in the Maya lands, the Olmecs, the Zapotecs, the Mixtecs, uh, the Mayans, and every, almost every culture, they had this legend of Quetzalcoatl. And you get the same principles take place down in South America, uh, right down in uh, Lake Titicaca, Bolivia, Peru, with, uh, with Viracocha, and it's exactly the same kind of legend. But we'll, 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 have, we'll describe some of his uh, legends as we go through the talk. But this is the area we're kind of, kind of looking at, the main Olmec heartland here. And over here is the main Maya lands, but there was cultures, the Teotihuacan up here, you get the Zapotec areas, um, and many other, all the way, the famous Yucatan sites are mainly up here with Chichen Itza and others, and the Guatemala and Tikal here. And, uh, and the Olmec influences didn't just, weren't just in this area here, which is mainly around the Gulf Coast. Um, but the origins go back to at least 2000 BC. I don't know if any of you have seen my talk I've done before about the Olmecs and or it's called Before the Maya. But these are just some of the famous sites, mainly the Trezapotes, Leventa and San Lorenzo, the three key Olmec sites. And there's been some uh, interesting discoveries at Tres Zapotes, uh, especially this particular calendar carving, which we'll be having a look at. Um, this is San Lorenzo. This, is, this was like the Olmec capital. This is one of the famous Olmec heads. Um, some people say it looks a bit like me, but I dispute that uh, officially. I need to get one of those. Yeah. What's going on? What is going on? <laughs> I was just going to measure up the size. Okay. And this is just this is a place called so San Lorenzo is like the mother site of the Olmecs, the most famous ancient. There's not hardly anything there because it's like um, swamplands, and there's nothing really left to see apart from these few stone carvings that are left. But they had some interesting energies they were working with there as well, and, and some of these are dated to 1,400 BC, which doesn't get anywhere near the origin date of the Mayan calendar, 3,114 BC. But they were working with interesting technologies. This particular uh, piece of iron ore magnet was found uh, in the last couple of decades, and it's believed that all the sites were built upon these magnetic anomalies. So somehow they were working with magnetism and electric charge and, uh, and different types of, they had lots of water channels cut into many of their sites. So if they did invent the calendar way back then, they were certainly advanced enough to come up with it or sophisticated enough or intelligent enough. So that uh, we really must accept, possibly accept that as a possibility that the Olmecs were involved in that. There's obvious connections with Egypt as well. The more you look into 
uh, the Olmec carvings, the more connections you find with Egypt and Africa, or maybe Nubia, Egypt, uh, and, and sort of part, other parts of Western Africa. You find the same symbolism. This is just one example here of the Egyptian uh, sky goddess holding up the sky, and you get the same thing here, exactly the same thing. And there's, there's many more. I'm just giving you one here just to go along with. Um, so this is the site at a place called San Andreas, which is up near Leventa. They found one of, one of the calendar examples. I mean, as, as Jeff will explain shortly when we get into the calendars, um, at San Andreas, they found a glyph or they found some carvings that had the 260 day uh, sacred count of the Zolkin calendar. Uh, and these are some of the carvings here that display that. And so it suggests that they were definitely using that calendar, so they may have originated that one for sure. There's also the Harb calendar, which is the 365 day solar calendar. And obviously the long count calendar, which stretches over you know thousands of years, but Jeff will um, go into the details about that. Here's just another site called Leventa, which I went to visit. And this is the first pyramid that was supposedly built in Central America before all the other Mayan sites. Uh, this is what they think it may have looked like, it kind of like a sort of seven sided fluted pyramid with all these uh, megalithic kind of structures throughout, including the, these strange people. Uh, but they were the first, it's first possibly evidence of using the wheel as well uh, in the Olmec lands. Now they didn't use it necessarily to do any major work, but they actually used it for toys, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, it's probably too swampy there, but they had all these amazing serpentine temples buried right under the ground, all these pavements piled upon one another. It's a huge, you know, it's like a masterpiece, but then they buried it in the ground for some reason. So there's a lot of dispute about why they would have done things like that. There's also evidence that they aligned Leventa uh, to the different stars and may have developed procession at some of the Olmec sites. Uh, studying the 26,000 year cycle. Here's just some of the other sites here. This is one of the Olmec heads in Leventa, and here's an unfinished one, and some other beastly looking features here. Now, I'll just skip through these because I just want to show you some, um, you know, give you a taste of the Olmec world. I really recommend if you do go to Mexico, make it up to Villa Hermosa and uh, go to Leventa Park. This is where many of the uh, stones are. Here's another connection with Africa. Obviously, you probably noticed this. With the Olmec heads, uh, they have very what appears to be negroid or African features. You can see this here, you can see another example here, and you get the same style of coffins built by the Egyptians as you do the Olmecs. This is the work of a uh, scholar called Ivan van Sertima, he's got a couple of books out. You can um, check out his work there. This is one of the Olmec heads that came from Tres Zapotes, now called, a place called Santiago Tuxla, which you can get to uh, very difficultly on a bus. But Tres Zapotes is the site where the true kind of mystery about the origins of the calendar first really came about. And Matthew Sterling, back in the early uh, 1950s and late 40s, was the main archaeologist there. And uh, these are some of the other things they discovered. But this is the stone that has the inscription uh, of the long count on it, which is the 5,125 year cycle from 3,114 BC up to 2012. And uh, before this was out, all the Mayanists, all the scholars believe the Mayans invented the calendar. That's why it's you know, called the Mayan calendar. But this proved that the Olmecs were definitely using a, the or a long count system, which is uh, virtually the same. Can I just say something there? It was actually uh, Matthew Sterling's wife, because uh, they found the bottom bit first, so they didn't have the uh, the Bacton number, which is the bar is five and the dot is two. So just above the crack there is number seven. Oh, thank you. Uh, there, that's seven. So that means it's in Bacton number seven. But they didn't know that when they found the bottom bit. And um, most of the miners were saying it must be Bacton eight because that's what fitted in with their theories. But it was Matthew Sterling's wife who said no, no, she believed it was Bacton seven. And of course, some years later, when they found the other bit, she was proved right. Uh, not not only was uh, you know she a woman, but she was only the archaeologist's wife as well. But yeah, she actually was more right than all they were. So. Okay, and um, 
Here's just another example, uh, sort of reconstruction of it with all, with all the dates down here. This is an image that Jeff put in the other day, one of the original photos when they discovered it. Uh, and here on the other side of this particular stone, and this is like probably about five or, you know, maybe six or seven feet tall, actually. There's this bizarre He-Man looking figure with all this kind of weird, weird sort of uh, chest thing he's got on. And also there what appears to be a kind of um, weird Jaguar's face, which is a symbol that you get throughout the Maya, uh, the Olmec world. Um, and many other places. There's also the another site was discovered um, called Chiapa de, de Corzo, uh, which they found another date which related to around this era, which is around 31 to 37 BC. Um, oh, what happened there? I put that in there for you. Oh, you put another one in. Okay. And uh, and this is the, this is the this is the stone here. So J Jeff will give you a little outline about this. <coughs> Well, this is the, the earliest known long count date. Uh, again, it's showing back to seven, but they, they're only really speculating that because in dot, it's in dots, okay? That, that there, you see, obviously it's broken off again, so we're missing uh, the back to number, which they've speculated is back to seven again because that now fits in with their, their slightly earlier acceptable date of where well, they thought it was the eighth back to for the last one then they went no it'll have to be back to seven then now they they don't want that to be any earlier than back to seven because they will have to rewrite all the or all the work everyone's done yet again um but you see this bit uh here is the uh part of the dissolkin so that tells you is that again it's broken off so you've got a bar and one dot the position of that dot tells us that that number was either a six uh, or a seven and that uh, they know what that glyph is as well so they know that was one of two possible glyphs and uh, they know exactly what those are but those actually could be something else so we've got a um, what have we got next what's that doing in there you put it in there oh but, right we'll get back to that later on don't we so uh, anyway, we're just going to uh, do a little sidetrack now about uh, Maya calendars generally. And um, it is actually, <coughs> it's been tradition ever since 1915 when uh, um, Morley produced this diagram in 1915. And ever since then, when people explain how the Maya calendars work, they've done it in terms of cogs. And here you've got uh, the Zolkin and on the other side, you've got the Harb. That's the 260 day calendar and the 365 day calendar interlocking in a cog fashion. And so the only time you get the same combination coming back again is every 52 years, and they call that a calendar round. Well, the Mayanists have been saying for ages, oh, you know, this is just for diagrammatic purposes to help us understand it, but the Maya would be horrified at anything like this. Yet, in the 17th century, when these books called the Chilam Balams were written, there were uh, diagrams like this. Well, they, they were originated in the 17th century, Right, they go back to an original uh, guy called the Chilambalam, who was probably 15th century, but they were written down in the 17th. And um, so you actually have two cogging wheels to describe two calendr calendrical cycles there. And so the, the point is that the concept is not as foreign to the Maya as some people would have us believe. Next, please. <laughs> so. We're going to be talking about the long count calendar. That's the one that, that uh, involves this cycle that ends in 2012. And I, in my little calendar book, I produced uh, um, a new way of looking at it. This is a slightly modified version of that. Um, so basically, at the bottom here, you have got a 13-day cycle and a 20-day cycle. They interlock to give you the Zolki in the 260 days. But this, is, this one here has got a dual purpose. It's also uh, the bottom, the 20 day cycle of the long count. So each of the petals is a day. There's 20 of them. 20 of those is called a weenal. So the whole of this wheel is a weenal of 20 days. But the 20 times the 13 gives you this Zolkin here, 13. Every time that goes round once, it knocks this one round once. So once that's come, gone round once, you've got 13 weenals, which is one Zolkin. And then going up this way, 20 days times, uh, this is the only exception here where it's, there's 18 leaves on here instead of 20. And so um, 18 of these weenals gives you one tun. That's a 360 day year, 18 times 20. 
But then this, if you get, take it this way, that clicks this, this 13 leaf wheel round so that 13 of those tunes is 13 tunes, a 13 tune cycle which is recorded in the Dresden Codex. Then you again multiply by 20 up here, 20 uh, tunes is one catoon, that's just under 20 solar years. Multiply it by 13 this time, you get 13 catoons, which is known as the short count calendar. That replaced the long count after it fell out of use around 900 AD. And then going up here again, multiplying by 20, 20 catoons is one bactoon, just under 400 solar years. Going this way, multiply it by 13, and you have the 13 bactoon cycle. The one we're talking about, it started in 3114 BC and ends in 2012. And then if you go again this way, that little five-point petal wheel, uh, multiply the 13 bactoon cycle by five, and you have the five eras, which are described in Maya mythology. And of course, if you count the, the amount of tunes in, in the 13 bactoon cycle, it's 5,200. Multiply it by five, you get 26,000 tunes, which is the precession cycle. So that describes a sort of evolutionary precession cycle. Then you go up again, and it's multiplied again, because in fact, although this is the 13 bactoon cycle and explains the long count that ends in 2012, there were other longer cycles. Next one, please. So there you can see it actually keeps on. If you keep going, multiplying by 20 in that direction and 13 in that direction, we get um, pictons. 20 bactons is a picton. Now, recently, some of the miners have been trying to um, shut everybody up about 2012, saying uh, nothing ends in 2012 because the uh, great cycle, as they call it, doesn't consist of 13 bactons, it consists of 20 bactons. Therefore, the cycle doesn't end till 4,772 AD. Um, and that is also uh, recorded in uh, King Pakal of Palenque actually recorded a date a commemoration of his uh, of his crowning, which will uh, be uh, a sort of an anniversary of it at the end of the Picton in, in another couple of thousand years. So the, the miners have been using that to shut everybody up. But in fact, what they don't realize, and which is what I developed this diagram for, is to show that uh, they, it's not an either or situation, it's both. We have a 13 Picton cycle, just as we have a 13 Bacton cycle and a 20 Bacton cycle, 13 Catoon cycle and 20 Catoon cycle. In fact, this goes through for all these cycles, although the 13 ones don't have a relationship vertically in this diagram, like the 20 ones. Um, you know, all these cycles have a purpose, and uh, the way I've, I've written an essay, especially to explain this, and I'm currently discussing it with a couple of these academics. Um, but, you know, they actually, uh, it's looking good. I think I'm getting somewhere. Uh, the, the orange, the little orange colours, is the historical scheme. That's what we usually talk about as the cycle. If we give it my date, 9-17-0-0-0-0, 13 a how 18 kumku, uh, for example. That would be the normal way of write, writing that particular date, which was a date in, uh, during the classic Maya period. Now, if you were to write the same thing using all these, all these uh, longer ones, the ones where the little red dots are, I've called that a meta-historic scheme. It's getting a little bit complicated now. I won't blow your minds too much with this, but basically there are some inscriptions that they can't explain just by this knowledge. So you have to basically come up with a diagram like that to explain these inscriptions, which are very long, uh, bigger cycles, and it also explains inscriptions from Cobra and Yaxchilam, which can't be explained by any of those, and it explains the period ending dates and the short count, all explained in one marvellous diagram. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. For calculating, uh, and we're going to go back to where, where we were when I started that digression, for calculating uh, these dates to work out from, the, from that um, Tres Zapotes, uh, date that we had that was cracked and the bits was missing. Uh, this is the, the uh, program that I've used. There, you, can, you can get this on my website if you go to the Maya Date Calculators page uh, and go through to the link, download it. It's a, a lovely little uh, calculator and basically you've got the Cablatons, the Pictons, the Bactons, the Catoons, the Tuns, the Weenals, the Kin, which is the days. And uh, the short count it does as well and it gives you the Julian day and the Gregorian day and it gives you the Zolkin and the Harb and even the Night Lord. 
So um, very handy little calculator that saves you uh, having smoke coming out of the ears. Right, next one, please. So um, this is something that Hugh asked me to do uh, for his before the Maya talk because, um, you know, realizing that that bit was missing, he thought, you know, this could be the evidence we're looking for that, that these um, long count dates actually originated much earlier than the academics are saying. Therefore, you know, we both like really annoying the academics. So um, basically, I got the calculator out and worked out some using all the knowledge that is preserved on that, um, that piece of uh, thing here, the, the, you remember that's either a six or a seven, so all the Zolkin dates will either be six Ben or seven Ben. I, I don't know why it says and there. That's a misprint. Um, but those other numbers are, you know, they know what those are, but the bit, some of these are a little bit questionable. So I've, I've made, that's the standard interpretation that this, this in the Gregorian backdated calendar will be the December the 6th, 36 BC, the, long, the oldest known long count date, um, which is pre-Maya, I see. So the Mayanists got annoyed about this, but now they've accepted it. But if it's any older than that, it's going to upset everybody. So these are our possibles if they was to find this and it, it turned out to be any of these dates. Now, would you like to say any more about that? I mean, I, I, the Chapa de Corso, the, the where it is, is actually right in the Olmec land. Um, it's not even, potentially it could be an Olmec site, and there's a lot of sites in that whole area. Uh, obviously there, was where all these dates are preserved in stone. I mean, there's some other calculations we did as well, uh, which are here, but the, the bottom row is the one that interested me the most because um, it's 3,249 BC, which is like 130 years before the 3,114 BC date. So it just kind of, I thought that was particularly interesting. And also the one above that as well, the 2736 BC. But again, this is speculative until that other bit of stone gets discovered and we can actually work it out properly, which is probably likely. It's probably just in someone's garden as an ornament in the local area for all we know. So uh, you never know. And these are some other dates um, you got from that as well. Can you explain these, Jeff? You remember doing that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay let's get back to looking at big stones again then um, just to keep everyone happy um so we're going to just drift back into the old Merc well for a bit because our slides have um, gone into a disarray um that's uh, one of the heads from uh laventa here's just some of the carvings as well and you see here on this particular carving that was found at laventa it's got these strange glyphs here and laventa is known to be about uh, 2000 to 1500 bc probably about 1800 bc you know in reality but there's no reason why they couldn't be much older they found these very strange waterworks there as well which would have been some of the first in the world but these glyphs here kind of caught my attention um, and there's another site called Comal Calco, which is uh, north of Leventa, which we're going to have a look at briefly later. Because it's got some bizarre carvings there from all these what appears to be different writings from all over the world, uh, which w would suggest there was transatlantic voyages and, and such other uh, places. Here's Leventa again. These are just some of the heads. These are the bizarre kind of long heads you get in this part of the world. You get skulls that are like that as well. Here's the underground uh, pavements here, which some people suggest may be glyph oriented. Um, here's just the uh, Egyptian looking kind of kid here sitting down uh, and the uh, man mountain or the first ever pyramid of that area. Uh, and here, here, this is very interesting because we start the serpent symbolism on the bottom of this, this particular sort of Olmec altar, which we'll come back to shortly. Um, but the other thing which is uh, particularly interests me, which is a little digression, just uh, because uh, I find it completely fascinating, there's a really famous major earth energy current that goes through Leventa. Um, it's this one here. And some of you may know Tor Webster's work or Robert Kuhn's work on the Rainbow Serpent. There's a great energy current that weaves around the whole planet. There's a second energy current called the Plume Serpent, which goes the other way around the planet through the Americas um, and at some other places in uh, the Far East. And I traced it when I was there, and it came in through Coastal Cocos, which is near Leventa, and through Tortuguero, which is a site that Jeff's been researching, and John Major Jenkins, which we'll come back to shortly. Also through Palenque and down through Capan and some other sites. Here is, this is where it actually goes. This is this one here. 
Uh, I found it down here as well when I went to Lake Titicaca. I found both of them crossing, in fact, on the Island of the Sun, which is a Viracocha uh, sort of temple site. And here it's all the Quetzalcoatl temple sites, and they've both obviously got the same name of the plumed or feathered serpent. Uh, this is the famous extension of the Michael and Mary line, this one. And this is the other great current that goes around the planet. Anyway, I thought I'd just show you that as a digression. Uh, again, there's my face, um, looking slightly old McCoy. And But this area here, Coast of Cocos, means actually Serpent Sanctuary. And it's a legendary beach where Quetzalcoatl arrived um, into that part of the world. And who's laughing? <laughs> <laughs> Or are you coughing? But this is the beach here, and I sort of decided to take a photo of the beach because it's been destroyed now. It's now an oil town, unfortunately. Um, so there's nothing left. There. So before you continue laughing, I'll just show you some other pictures. Um, but Quetzalcoatl, the name obviously Plume Serpent, or some people call it the Rainbow Serpent, Feathered Serpent, many different names. He was the god of wind, he was related to Venus, um, and he was really the, the legendary founder of many of the sort of traditions that ended up uh, becoming famous in the Olmec, the Zapotec, Mixtec, uh, Mayan cultures, where he taught the arts of farming, the arts of civilization, even taught the art of vegetarianism and, and to stop killing and stop sacrifice that was prevalent very strongly in that part of Mexico at the time and he basically taught peace and some people relate him to a kind of Jesus like figure uh, but he was supposed to be uh, he was very fair skinned he had bright eyes and wore these dark robes that's slightly wrong that image and, uh, and he turned up on this raft of serpents that made no noise and didn't have any oars and just arrived on the beach at Coastal Cocos and they came onto the land and spread their teachings across uh, the Maya lands and the Olmec lands of Mexico. So this is kind of, I find this really fascinating. I mean, who were these people? And almost every culture in the Mayan world, Zapotec, Mixtec, Toltec world, have, have references to this, gl this golden age of when Quetzalcoatl was around. And so I find it really interesting that there's exactly the same legends, almost to the, you know, exactly the same, were found in South America, uh, at Bolivia and Peru, uh, under the name Viracocha, which again translates as the plumed serpent or the feathered serpent. And so who were the people who emerged from Lake Titicaca down there and taught all the arts of megalithic construction, agriculture, uh, farming? And uh, there's so many legends and stories that stretch back into prehistory. Um, uh, many people believe that there was a, an actual man, a king, a Toltec king in the 10th century who resided at Tula, where the famous Atlantean uh, megalithic columns are. Um, but we believe now that he actually took on, embodied Quetzalcoatl and sort of became um, and, and sort of went, sort of lived out some of the legendary stories that he actually did. But anyway, um, here's the, which is where this particular line goes. Most of the sites upon these these lines are, have dedications to Viracocha, or sorry, to Quetzalcoatl. It's really similar to me uh, when you get the Michael and Mary energy lines going through England. Uh, the Michael line tends to go to sites dedicated to St Michael, St George, and other such other such legends and, and uh, saints. Whereas the lion is dedicated to Mary and to Bridget and to other kind of goddess or goddess kind of people. So um, the same kind of principle may be happening with these energy lines in this part of the world. But this is just speculation, early research on that at the moment, but I just thought I'd uh, put that in there. But particularly it goes through Leventa, which is up, on, up near the coast. And this here, along the bottom here, you may see this, is what appears to be a serpent. Uh, and actually, this, this, this is a queen or um, a sort of goddess figure. Her arm suddenly turns into a serpent where it touches the ground and then comes around this side. And uh, he's holding the guy there, the sort of priestly kind of shaman guy, is holding the energy against the ground. I believe that's a, a symbol of uh, earth energies. And you can see here some other serpent heads coming in from different angles. So yeah, I just found, I found that particularly interesting. And there's other serpent symbolism as well throughout the Americas, uh, which Jeff's going to have a little chat about now. <clears throat> this is the uh, actual same pyramid I've got on my T-shirt here. Uh, it's the pyramid of Kukul Khan at uh, Chichen Itza. And, it, and Kukul Khan is another name for Quetzalcoatl, a later name. Yeah, that's what the Maya called uh, Quetzalcoatl because the Toltecs brought the knowledge down from the north when they inhabited um, Chichen Itza and this p temple was built to commemorate what they then called uh, Kuku Khan. I can't say something there because um, Kuku, I mean, there's a legend of the 10th century Toltec king who was at Tula 
or supposedly it was called Tolan then, the legendary city of Tolan. He was driven out by this dark god who I can't uh, remember the name. It's Catlipolka. Oh, of yes. course, yes. And, uh, and he drove out, uh, he was called the Smoking Mirror as well was his other name. And he drove out Quetzalcoatl and wanted to bring back in sacrifice and all these dark arts. So he fled. Some people, some legends say he fled and left Mexico and Guatemala altogether and disappeared on his raft of serpents, promising to return at this particular time in, in, uh, in the future on a particular sort of era or date. Um, but some people say he fled to Chichen Itza and actually founded the Toltec city of, of Chichen Itza, which is what Jeff's talking about now. So, but then, incidentally, I just throw this in, I might as well just throw it in now. When the Spanish came, uh, when Cortes came in 1519 or thereabouts, and he arrived on the Gulf Coast in these boats that boated and didn't make any noise with all these white looking people with beards and robes who then got off the boat so all the, all the locals believed it was the return of Quetzalcoatl especially because the date he arrived on the day he arrived on was one of the prophetic dates uh, which was related to what when Quetzalcoatl said he would come back many thousands of years earlier so and so they welcomed him in thinking they were the gods returning um, so this is incidental, but that's just why they had such power over over the Mexicans and were able to sort of overthrow the entire culture and the Aztecs uh, in one foul swoop. So, um, yeah, sorry, over to you. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> well, uh, the Maya associated Quetzalcoatl with Venus because it, it said that he turned into Venus in one of the myths. Uh, he threw himself into the fire, didn't he, he one, one of them, um, and then became a star which was Venus, but the, unlike our conception of Venus as the planet of love, they, they uh, had a war association with Venus. It was a good, when Venus was rising was a good time to uh, go into battle. Um, but uh, some people have suggested that uh, there's a connection with the, um, the Venus uh, transits. That are, you know we had one in uh, 2004 and eight years later we have one in 2012 with a two-day difference because it's exactly eight Maya halves rather than eight of our years. They didn't have leap days, so it's exactly eight halves between the transits of Venus. And uh, looking back through uh, previous transits of Venus, there have been uh, interesting developments, um, uh, historical sort of jumps in knowledge between the, uh, between the Venus transit points. And so some people have suggested that previously they were expecting, uh, I think it was when Cortes arrived, was actually between two of these Venus transits. And that, that's why they, were, they mistook him for Quetzalcoatl. Um, but, uh, you know, because uh, in 2012 the Venus transit will be on the um, 6th of June. It was on the 8th of June in, uh, in 2004. Uh, I just thought I'd uh, mention that. So, um, at Chichen Itza, you have these uh, stone snake heads at the bottom of the pyramid, and uh, every uh, spring equinox, you have the, the shadow play. I mean, you've probably all heard about it. Thousands of people know about it and, and uh, every year now, but as the sun uh, goes down in the afternoon, it, you get a shadow play, starts down the zigzaggy bits of the steps, and it's enhanced by the snake head and looks like a giant snake coming down the pyramid. Well. It turns out that in the Yucatec Maya language, the word uh, for the, the tail, well, the, the rattle on the end of that rattlesnake, the same rattlesnake that's used in all the art of the Maya, they call it Zab. And that happens to be the same word they use for the Pleiades constellation. And then there's a little marking on that same uh, snake that looks like a little smiley face. It's the same as the Maya glyph for the sun, which is a how. Um, so, what John Major Jenkins has done, this is his diagram, he's, he's basically realised that this whole thing is encoding uh, a, uh, an astronomical alignment between the zenith sun, that's where the, the sun is exactly in the sky overhead in the tropics, it happens twice a year, but when that combines with the Pleiades, um, somehow this, 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 this thing he's, is an alarm clock bringing that, that uh, celestial alignment into, uh, into our attention. And it's something that will happen because the Pleiades is five degrees wide and one degree of precession takes 72 years. It's um, 360 years it will take for the sun to cross the Pleiades because 
precession, remember, is moving the stars slightly in the other direction from, from the way that the planets go, while the sun stays the same place, you know, every year on the same day. So uh, over 360 years, the sun crosses the Pleiades, but that is just starting now. So this is really an alarm clock starting in 2012, according to Jenkins' uh, deduction here, that shows us about this um, conjunction of the Pleiades and the sun, because this is the, the exact same way that the Aztecs and the Toltecs used to use to measure precession. They go up a hill uh, every 52 years, actually, uh, to, to see where the Pleiades was at midnight. Because if the Pleiades was directly overhead at midnight, they knew that six months away on the Zenith Passage Day, uh, that, uh, but that it would be the end of the world, because, so-called, because the sun would be conjuncting the Pleiades. So they've passed this whole cosmology on to the uh, Yucatec Maya, who've encoded it in this pyramid. And uh, on that day in 2012, uh, well, it's, it's, uh, it's not the actual equinox, it's actually 60 days after the equinox that this happens, uh, when, when you get this configuration that is given to us by the snake symbolism there. And it will actually also be the day of a solar eclipse on the 20th of May next year. And there you have it. So it's the snake, you can see it interestingly, where's that pointery thing? The pat this is the uh, um, a certain species of rattlesnake. Uh, and I've gone and forgotten which, what, the, what the, title, the name of it is in Latin now. But basically, it's got these little pyramids on it. And uh, it has uh, 13 scales around the mouth and 13 rattles on the tail. And it's, it's been a really heavy influence in my art, mathematics, and, and culture. And the, the, the actual fact that the snake also sheds its skin gives it the, uh, the symbolism of rebirth as well. And then here you have Quetzalcoatl in the mouth of the snake. Um, and that also, the god in the mouth of the snake has other s symbolisms which have to do with 2012 because it also means the, the, the head of the god represents the sun and the mouth of the snake or the jaguar toad or the crocodile represents the dark rift of the Milky Way or the birth canal of the great uh, cosmic mother. And that represents the alignment of the winter solstice sun with the galactic plane at the fat part of the Milky Way, the, which is the visual galactic center, which is what Peter mentioned earlier on. And um, snakes have also been referenced in crop circles like this one, which shows an Ouroboros where the snake's swallowing its own tail, giving us the meaning of time cycles. So it has all these meanings as well. You want to talk about snakes? Well, yeah, because I'm um, talking about Ouroboros or Ouroboros. This is like that around the planet because these kind of go all the way around the planet, these particular energy lines. So I find that symbolism quite interesting. That's connected actually in these earth energies that kind of go through this part of the world where this is actually uh, been referenced in legend and in myth. So, uh, and also it goes through another site down here, Kapan, is what I didn't mention earlier. Um, but yeah, we'll just have a little look at that. And uh, we're gonna move back into our next segment of the talk is about this area here, Tortuguero. And this is something that John Major Jenkins and Jeff have been researching and challenging uh, what the scholars have been saying about it. Uh, I went to Tortuguero um, because Jeff told me to go there um, when I was in Mexico. Good boy. And these are the photos I got, but actually nothing, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> these are the photos I got, but it's actually been totally destroyed, unfortunately. And it's the only uh, the Mayan site. It's, it's contemporary with Palenque, more, more or less. It's, it's not far from Palenque. Uh, it's about 40, maybe 30 miles away. Uh, but we went up there, and I went up there with this guy, Ivan Orozco, and uh, we met a local guide, and they showed us around, and we got chatting with all the locals, and they gave us um, a guided tour, but there's nothing left. They, came, they say that the military came in 12 years ago and actually just destroyed the whole site after looting it. Uh, this was never recorded officially, but this is what was witnessed by the locals. And it has then been slowly uh, eaten up and taken uh, taken down by the the quarry that's been built next door. But the reason Tortuguero is so important because it's one of the only, if not it's the only stone, the only carving that actually has the end date that references uh, this December the 21st, 2012. And it's in obviously in many different parts. Uh, many of you who were at Megalithomania would have seen uh, John Major Jenkins discuss the latest photos and the latest research on that. So um, I'll let Jeff describe this image on the left because it kind of gives um, an interpretation of it and new interpretations have come out. Over to you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I won't try and uh, pronounce this uh, language, but um, this is one of the first uh, 
I think this is actually, yes, this is a, uh, it's not an official minus, this guy, but he's, he's based his translation on what David Stewart, who's an epigrapher, said, but he, there's one major difference. Um, he calls himself Pakal something or other. Um, the Pakalian group, yes. Um, the, the main difference is this glyph here, anyway. Basically, eight school years and three times 400, that's the, the Bacton uh, 360 days. They've got basically a, a, a eight, that's the, the symbol for the Bacton. This is um, at the, the ending, the ending of a period symbol. That's the 13th Bacton, four Ahau, three Kankin. These three glyphs together give you 21st of December 2012. That's three calendars cross referencing each other. Then um, it will happen. Darkness. Now that this is the, one of the controversial glyphs because um, first of all they they didn't they just have it will happen. But um, several epigraphers then said no, it, it, it's basically darkness because the trouble is you can see over here the uh, the glyphs have been chipped off, so they they were having trouble coming up with anything for these. But uh, for a while they were saying darkness. Uh, and it will be the descent, that's of the, this symbol here is the, you can see the nine, that's the nine support god, so-called, which is Bolon Yoktiku, it's translated as the, the, the nine-footed god, amongst other things. So it's a return of this nine god group to the, and they couldn't finish it because the last glyph was missing. So that was the state of affairs in 2006 when this was first put into the public domain. So, um, uh, what the uh, Mayanists have been saying about this recently, it's come up in discussion recently because um, everybody's been talking about it, so they have basically decided to try and uh, shut everybody up about it, as they usually do. And Stephen Houston here said, Monument 6, it has nothing to do with prophecy or the supposed dread events that wait us in AD 2012. About that, the Maya are notably silent or, truth be told, a bit boring. And then uh, along comes Mark Van Stone and says, Yes, I agree with Houston, it is a bit boring. So it's just supposed to, don't bother looking at that, it's just too boring to even consider. I don't know, I mean, I mean that, if you go back to that, I mean, just what it says there, in December the 21st, 2012, there will be darkness, and there will be the descent of the nine gods to Earth, probably. So there's going to be darkness, and what, a load of aliens or something come down? What's uh, that? Well, this is what we look at next. What, what could this mean? Yeah. Okay. And the next one, yeah. This is this is what's left. Uh, no, back a bit. <laughs> this is what's left of it. Um, the that bit and that bit. That's the bit you saw the photograph of there. Uh, this is the bit with the the wing, as they call it, with the with the 2012 date on it. There was originally another wing here, which may have been looted by the uh, the military. In fact, flange, a flange would be a good <laughs> word for it. Yes. Um, that bit's in Villa Hermosa Museum with that bit. Those two are in private collection. No one knows who's got it anymore. That bit's in the uh, Metropolitan Museum, New York. And those two bits are also in Villa Hermosa. So, um, what it basically, uh, the dates, the dates on this, uh, including the, the couple that were probably on this bit. Um, it tells us that the sh this was erected to commemorate an underground shrine called a Pibna, and that, that shrine was completed in 510 AD. This was erected in 669 AD. The site was discovered in uh, 1915. The first study was published in Germany in 1978. The site was destroyed when a cement factory was put on it in 1981, and then the, finished off by the army, as Hugh mentioned. And then the first study published in English by Sven Gronemeyer was in 2006, and that's when everybody was really started talking about it. So just looking close up at that, uh, that bit that we've translated just now, uh, I got Gronemeyer's German, um, for the, fir the first German work he did on this, and with some help from a German friend, uh, I, I came out with this version of it slightly different if you going past the preamble there it goes uh blah blah it was two days nine wheels three turns eight turns and three back turns before the 13th back turn is completed on four or how three kankin then it will happen darkness that and bolognotti will descend to the so gronemeyer also was coming in with darkness there but the interesting thing is that this 
they're describing the uh, the Pibna, the underground chamber that this was associated with, as having a function of nascent becoming, which is really rebirthing. And uh, that's a concept that comes up a lot in association with 2012. And it's also called a becoming ripe house or an underground house. Anyway, the Mayanists like to do transliterations. It's not proper translation. They want to keep it accurate. And what you come up with doesn't actually make a lot of literal sense. So if you were to put it into English, it would be uh, something like, this precious stone was set up in the shrine portal 158 years and 38 days after the 7th of December, 510 AD, when Akal Cook's rebirthing shrine was completed. This was 1,502 years and 14 days before the end of the current era on December 21st, 2012. Then it will happen, darkness and the descent of the nine underworld gods to the, because it's now established that the nine Bolognyoktiku gods are very, very similar, if not the same thing, to the nine underworld gods. So, Jeff, was this, because there's all this talk about the Mayan prophecies going on and on and on before uh, this even got discovered and, and was researched. Is this like backing up the whole Mayan prophecies idea now? Well, yeah, up until um, 2006, the official academic position was the, the, the Maya were not interested in 2012. There's no evidence whatsoever in the inscriptions. There's virtually quoting them word for word. Nothing in the inscriptions, nothing in any of the codices. There's no evidence at all to indicate they're at all interested in it. And it's all been invented by New Age people. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I was involved uh, in the discussion that actually projected this into the public domain um, because uh, Robert Sittler, who'd written an essay saying something very similar to what I just said, had put that on a university website and I got into a, a discussion with him on email and I sent him some evidence from the Chilean Balams that made me think, con convinced that he's not correct on that. Anyway. He, th he thought it was sufficiently interesting to ask some epigraphers directly where he'd been indirect before, and that's when Stuart came up with that translation that we, that we heard just now. Um, so, um, did I go off topic there? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, Gronemeyer has recently taken a new look at this. He's, uh, he's originally did it, started on work on it by himself, and he's finished off the paper with another uh, minus called Barb McLeod. Uh, but having looked through the paper is a bit disappointing because there seems to be an effort to try and do exactly what uh, Houston suggested and make it all rather boring. A uh, new drawing has been drawn since they got hold of some better photographs and they found that the darkness glyph actually is not darkness, it's something else. The bottom glyph, they have then used a lot more projections to decide that that actually has a possible meaning that fits in with what they think it might mean. So uh, on to the next one. This uh, discussion, some of, uh, some of the uh, correspondence is in Van Stone's book and it involves all these Mayanists here. That's uh, Michael Grof, who's a sort of, um, uh, he's been working with Jenkins a little bit, I'll say about, more about that. That's uh, um, the child prodigy originally from 12 years old. Um, this guy, uh, Stuart, was, was able to translate glyphs uh, better than the academic professionals. And there's, there's footage of him working along with them. Uh, this is Barb McLeod, who's also been doing some good work uh, along with Growth to show that the Maya did precession and they encoded it into their inscriptions. Um, that is a, a nice picture of the whole thing reconstructed of the uh, right hand flange. Uh, anyway, what Gronemeyer, uh, well, rather, what Van Stone came up with half before Gronemeyer had put out his first publication was this will have been completed the 13th Bact and will happen the witnessing attending of the display of Bolognocti in the great impersonation envelopment in costume and regalia. Now, he was trying to make it boring, I contend, and I think he succeeded pretty well there. <laughs> uh, but when Gronemeyer's first uh, effort uh, appeared, it wasn't, this is not the final version, but um, basically the, the main differences were that one, instead of darkness, became see or a seeing. That one, he Bolognoctiku holds, and that one, which was previously untranslatable, they say, is in a great encircling, uh, like we just heard. But at the beginning of Sven's piece, he went on, he introduced the whole thing by saying exactly what I mentioned just when I was talking about the calendars, saying nothing ends in 2012 because there's only, there's actually 20 Bactons in the 13 Bactons cycle and not 13. But this is an effort by the Mayanists to try and shut everyone up about it 
but, but to do that, they have to resurrect an ancient argument from 1915, which is totally outdated, because in 1950, Thompson established that there's a 13 back cycle and a 20 back cycle, as shown in my diagram. Uh, next one, please. So what uh, Gronemeyer's first effort was this. It will be completed the 13th back to its four how three can out will happily seeing he bolon yoktiku holds shows in a great encircling still doesn't make a lot of sense does it? Uh, and it and then Sven actually says yes it is a bit boring they're like admitting it really but the interesting this way get is interesting because th he shows the workings out and the uh, various uh, possibilities that all those uh, glyphs have been translated not just in that one way in the past they've been translated in many different ways as you can see here so he shows could be all these different things and uh, the other part could even be dilute dissolve or prepare the coffee you know so there's a huge uh, variety of different meanings that could end up with something that is not boring at all as we will demonstrate in the next slide so you could have and there will be a revelation and there will be an apparition and people's eyes will be opened and there will be mass visions and perceptions will pierce the veil. You, these are all interpretations that fit in with the, uh, with the other meanings given. And uh, that one, the writing has completely disappeared. Oh, click the thing, it might appear. Hang on, click it again. Ah, oh, yes. Bolon Yokti Q will be, this is the second bit, will be imprisoned in a sealed in a great enclosure. Could also be Bolon Yokti Q will make the coffee. Bolon Yoktiku will reveal a huge crop circle. Or Bolon Yoktiku will be proclaimed as godfather. Bolon Yoktiku will start a great whirling. Bolon Yoktiku will offer a great prayer. And Bolon Yoktiku will proclaim, proclaim the great wedding or the spiritual wedding. All far, far more uh, interesting than the standard interpretation, giving us combinations such as at the completion of the 13th Bacton on 4 House Ring Kankin, there will be mass hallucination as the deity Nine Dog Tree reveals the circle of tutelary gods. Or at the completion of the 13th Bacton on 4 House Ring Kankin, uh, there will be a mass enlightenment when the nine footed god inaugurates the spiritual wedding. Or at the completion of the 13th Pact on 4 House 3 Kankin, the veil will dissolve when the ninefold god encircles the ecliptic. Not boring at all, is it? But this is a good one. At the completion of the 13th Pact on 4 House 3 Kankin, there will be the apocalypse, which actually means a revelation or a seeing, when the nine gods of the underworld, yes, those people said that and they're official, put everything in order. We like it. So who are these nine gods that everyone uh, that it keeps keeps coming up here? Um, well, according to Michael Grove and uh, um, that other one just now, that the Bolognotti coup are the same person as the Lord of the Underworld. And here's this, some of the evidence. This is God L, Lord of the Underworld, and uh, this is a, a, a something that's shown in the. Uh, uh, the Temple of the Cross at Palenque, which is actually described as a pibna, the same kind of underground chamber, possibly as the Tordeguero monument was set up to commemorate. Here you can see something called the um, skeletal centipede. goes over his shoulder, comes down the other side. On it are nine little footsteps, collecting us up to the uh, God of Nine Steps, so that's one of the pieces of evidence that this is the very same as the God of the Underworld. And there he is in the underworld with some other gods and Bolognotti Ku's glyph is right in front of him there. Uh, so Godel was chief of the underworld, present at creation, appears in Shibalba, which is the underworld. Um, yes, I just said that, okay. So the, the very latest interpretation of this in the second version of uh, Gronemeyer's revelations was that what this is actually probably about is connected to a, a ceremony that goes on every year in Santiago Atitlan, a little town on the uh, Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. They have this statue called Mashimon, and uh, that's a picture of it there. They dress it every, every year at Easter, they dress it up. It used to be done at the Wayeb, which are the five days added onto the 360, the end of the Harb, so it's a, the end of a time cycle. They dress this thing up offer it gifts of uh, tobacco and alcohol, and at the end of the period, they uh, hang it by the neck and then chop to pieces. Very similar to what actually goes on in Hastings every year uh, on the May Day, which is 
very welcoming in the spirit of summer. They all the Morris dancers arrive. They go through the town with this huge uh, effigy called Jack in the Green, uh, made out of leaves, and they take it up to the castle. They all dance around all day, and then they all rip it to pieces, and you take a bit home with you. And it's uh, it's about the end of a time cycle and the beginning of a new time cycle. Well, there's now a suggestion that what uh, the the Mayanists think that that uh, Tordoguero monument means is that the this is what uh, Peter mentioned that the king of Tordoguero is expecting to sort of reincarnate at a ceremony in 2012 where he will preside over this ceremony and the statue of the nine gods will be just like the Mashimon statue where it will be dressed up sort of worshipped and then ripped to pieces to bring in the giant time cycle of the new 13 Bacton cycle and it could represent uh, yeah, the um, possibly that this is um, the maze god, who is an alternative version of Wanahau, the, the, the sun god, which is the sun eclipsing the galactic center, uh, resurrecting in the spring, defeating God El. That's what happens every year, but on a larger level, the maze god uh, could be resurrecting in 2012 for the new uh, 13 Bacton cycle. And Bolon Yachty, the nine gods of the underworld, will fall back into a dark place using that darkness interpretation. All right. Um, so the very final version that Gronemeyer came up with, with slightly improved on this previous one. It will be completed the 13th back and it's four how three kank and it will happen to seeing it's the display of Bolon Yachty in a great investiture. So they see it as a ceremony in which uh, yeah, they dress up this god as a sort of welcoming in the new uh, era. And that, that's so they've they haven't completely discounted 2012. They have but they've kind of um, watered it down a bit. But uh, what Jenkins has been discovering with growth is quite interesting. All these 13 dates on, the, uh, on that monument all relate to number 13 is the December 2012 date. All the other dates on it relate directly to that date. And it turns out that every one of them has uh, an astronomical, astronomically significant event associated with it. They found this from astronomical software, winding them back to those dates. And they found, you know, the winter solstice sun is in the dark, DR's dark rift in 2012. It turns out Balamahal, the lord of, uh, or the king of Tordoguero, was actually born when the sun was in the dark, the dark rift. And the Pibna was erected when the sun was in the dark rift. And the dark rift comes up quite a lot in the other dates with conjunctions of various planets involving uh, Jupiter, Mercury, Venus. Um, it's work that's uh, still in progress and uh, and all being still looked at. Very interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, now this is where it connects up to uh, to Hugh's uh, theory, because uh, recently they came up with this drawing of from Comal Calco, uh, which was drawn in 1984. But in 1990, Eric Book said this inscription means for a how three Kankin arrives, it will be completed, meaning that there could have been another reference to 2012 shock horror um, but then in uh, July last year Mark Zender says no no don't no it's not you're mistranslating it's for how three Zul he arrives at Zuk Kak which has got nothing to do with it so they do disagree with each other very regularly but the interesting thing is that this other squiggle alongside of it has been said to be Malinki which is a sub-Saharan script linking the whole of this uh, Komal Kalku and uh, you know the origins of the Maya calendar with uh, an African connection mm. And uh, they actually found that the Zolkin is very similar to a calendar that they found on uh, Tenerife, where they have a 520-day cycle, which is two Zolkins. Over to you. Um, okay. Oh, back to you, Jeff. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, a little uh, bit more question on who the nine gods are, if, if these people or beings are associated with the beginning of this 13 back to cycle and with the end of it next year, who are they? These are the glyphs, various glyphs that have been used to represent them. There are various names for them, numerous strides, God of Nine Steps, Nine Dog Tree, Nine Footed God, Jaguar Foot Tree. This is really all possible ways that that term Bolon Yotiku can be translated. They're gods of conflict, warfare, dangerous transition times, social unrest, eclipses, natural disasters like earthquakes, they appear at the end of Bactons, and they came when the when the Spanish arrived, uh, according to the myth, the mythology. Anyway, uh, assisted at the last creation, 
and they will be present at the next creation in 2012. Right. Because uh, there is um, actually carvings of the nine gods at this certain temple in Palenque. Uh, there's three of them there on the left. Uh, I'm sitting down next to them on these great megalithic steps there. But um, so there's quite a few references to them in a. They're in the they're in tomb of Lord Pakal at the bottom of the temple of inscriptions. They're all around the edge, edge oh. there. Well, there's nine gods around the surrounding his tomb. What actually on the lid? No, surround. The that's the the tomb lid. On the walls surrounding the lid are nine gods. They all look very similar, don't they? Yours. We've seen this bit. Have we? Oh, keep going. Okay. I think I might have put it in twice. <laughs> okay, cool. So we've just been looking at, uh, you know, obviously the nine god uh, different things, but there's a whole load of sites that as you head further south through Mexico and into um, the Azapa region, then go into Guatemala, uh, this area here, this is, this is the site that John Major Jenkins has been d working with a lot and there's a whole load of other sites going into southern Guatemala. This is just, a, I'm just going to show you some images just to, uh, uh, I suppose, watering about it. Uh, this is um, a very bizarre headdress of this particular kind of warrior type dude. Weird teddy bear headed dude there punching a little person. And then you get these glyphs here which kind of caught my attention, which, which have never been deciphered. No one knows what language they are, but there's uh, potential uh, connections with um, you know the Mayan glyphs, and also here you get these kind of uh, these these guys here holding up uh, all this upon it. So there's lots of uh, stuff that still hasn't been worked out yet. This is a place called Bilbao, which is one of the most dangerous places in, in Guatemala. We found out after we got there, uh, and in the fields there, they got these huge stones with bizarre carvings on. But this whole area has connections uh, with calendars. I mean, Abash Takalik, uh, which is a place we'll get to in a moment um, and Izapa all have these sort of effigies and there's particular I mean this is what John Major Jenkins has been working on particularly he believes all the Mayan creation stories are linked in with all the all the different glyphs and carvings at Izapa but we won't really have time to go into that now but I just want to show you some images just to here are some um, what's going on out there it's, it's kind of a bit mental um, these are some sort of psilocybin mushroom carvings uh, which have been found in this part of Central America and um, huge megalithic blocks as well. So I'm just going to give you a little kind of a, a holiday photos thing for a few minutes. But we come back to the serpent symbolism as well with a double serpent intertwining. And in the mouth of the serpent here is like, well, it's like a person being eaten by them. I thought it was their, their tongue sticking out originally, but it could be a person stuck in there, which is... a uh, yeah, quite interesting. Uh, this is a weird old mech head found in a place called La Democracia in southern Guatemala, which has got what appears to be spectacles on, uh, or sunglasses, and he looks a bit, you know, doesn't look too happy. And here's some Buddha-type features as well, which is a place called Monte Alto that these came from originally. And these are a bizarre culture that no one has a clue about where they came from. But this is really all in the region of Izapa, which is uh, the place John Major Jenkins has been researching. I don't know too much about Izapa myself, but Jeff might want to say a few words on this. But what caught my attention uh, was these particular kind of serpent symbolism and uh, the Bufo Marinus toad uh, was fo has got lots of carvings of that there. Plus there's connections with the serpent and Egypt again. We, we find that type of symbolism with the serpent and the wings coming off this godlike uh, being. Here you get the same thing in Egypt with the winged person which could be a representation of uh, Quetzalcoatl um, and this could be a representation of Osiris because lots of the myths from that part of the world are connected. Uh, that um thing at the bottom there, him, um, that uh, according to Jenkins' research, this, this uh, represents uh, the god uh, Wanhunapu, who is the solar deity. These are the solar rays. And uh, he's, if you go back to the last one, uh, you can see that he's actually in the mouth of a big toad there. Well, that, that, um, that mouth represents the dark rift of the Milky Way, which is also seen as a birthing place. And so it, it, it's talking about the conjunction of the sun with the dark rift. And that's uh, something that happens actually takes um, 36 years because the sun's half a degree wide and precession is 72 years per degree approximately, or 71. Um, and so from 1980 to 2016, the sun will be crossing that. but. Uh, you know, during that period is the end point of the calendar, which uh, 
Jenkins has, has basically done a very good job of, of showing that uh, that's why they put it there. OK, we're just going to show you some pictures of some toads and mushrooms for a little while, um, just to change the subject. Um, but one of the things that keeps coming up in this part of southern Guatemala is, uh, which you know, I believe, John Major Jenkins believes and Jeff probably believes, uh, their visionary states they were having way back then, like we're talking 100 BC to possibly right into the Olmec era of 2000 BC. They were obviously taking all these psilocybin type mushrooms. There's all these toads uh, available. Um, uh, and one of the, we're gonna, there's a little discussion we're having about this, whether there was actually Bufo Marinas toads in that part of Mexico. But the Bufo Marinas toad apparently excretes this substance from its shoulders if you hassle it a bit and poke it. <coughs> and if you c collect that and dry it out in the correct manner, then smoke mm. it. It's On uh, the windscreen of your car, it's good apparently. So what? To dry it. <laughs> Stick it on <laughs> your windscreen. See, right, scrape it off. It. <laughs> but if you smoke it, it's actually like 5 MeO DMT, which is uh, the most, one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, you can actually have on the planet. I think Jeff's actually had, did you have some? Oh no, you got someone know. else to take it. That's right, you? I took notes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so they think that, you know, because in, in uh, San Lorenzo, in the Olmec lands, they found lots of these bones of these particular toads, which suggests that they were using it in a ceremonial fashion. Uh, and somehow they got preserved. So there's suggestions that they were smoking DMT, and this could be the inspiration and the visions you get from this kind of thing, like ayahuasca and other stuff. But everybody uh, says it's uh, Bufo Marinas, but in fact, if you look at it on Eroid, it, 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 they, they reckon there that it's Bufo Alvarius because that's the Colorado cane toad, and they say that's further north. That just contains bufotenine, the hallucinogenic effects of which are arguable. Uh, this one, according to Eroid, contains the bufotenine plus the 5-MeO-DMT. And uh, that's the dimethyltryptamine. 5-MeO is a slight modification on that. But the thing is that this, under certain circumstances, is produced in your pineal gland anyway. Mm. Uh, and I think that's got something to do with 2012, actually. But there's lots of, uh, there's so many carvings in that part of southern Guatemala. Um, which have got this bufo toad on it and also these psilocybin mushrooms. So it does suggest they revered them and they weren't just, you know, recreational or anything like that. It was actually part of their culture. And you can see in the graphic down there at the bottom in the middle there, the guy waving, waving them about um, in a very happy way. Um, and so, you know, there is something going on there. And like you say, you know, we do excrete DMT from our pineal gland anyway. And, and what is the story on that? You mentioned? Uh, <coughs> well, if you want a quick, uh, someone asked me earlier on to give me a quick, uh, give them a quick resume on my favorite theory. Well, I, I can repeat it for you if you like. Um, I think that uh, the, the, uh, the whole solar system is traveling into an area of charged plasma. The plasma is seeping into the solar system, causing uh, atmospheric and magnetic changes on all the planets and kicking off the, uh, the solar activities which are going to culminate in a uh, record-breaking um, solar maximum next year, as uh, predicted by NASA. Uh, but that will also, uh, you know, cause, uh, it's also responsible for the increasing Earth changes we're seeing, and will also the plasma coming in will uh, cause changes to the, uh, to the people's um, subtle bodies. And uh, the, that will, uh, there'll also be a kicking off of a, um, a, either a magnetic reversion inversion or a, a, a movement of the geomagnetic field that will then uh, cause the uh, mental trigger of the pineal gland, which has little magnetite crystals in it, to kick it into secreting DMT and possibly harmine as well, which are the two hallucinogenic ingredients of uh, ayahuasca, and they've both been proven now to be secreted in the pineal gland under certain circumstances. Uh, so uh, that could cause a sort of mass vision of, uh, visioning of mankind, so uh, look out. I'm not really sure what to say after that, to be quite honest with you. But I'll just show you some pictures of mushrooms, uh, stones. Uh, I think that might be the answer. This one's got one on his head. Look, on the right there. And uh, and there's another one here. This is all in the Guatemala City Museum. It's really worth going here if you're in um, in that part of the world. There's some amazing stones and artifacts there. Um, huge amount of uh, frogs and mushrooms, uh, surprisingly. And Abash Takalik, there's stuff. There's, there's some uh, interesting discoveries here which interest me. Uh, and there are also relationships. That there's um, some carvings related to the Long Count calendar here uh, that have been sort of mentioned on a few of the stones, which John Major Jenkins pointed out. But the, the thing on the right here is uh, on the left 
left here rather is um what they think is a classic Olmec head that's been discovered in uh, southern Guatemala, which is the only one. You can see the ear piece there. Um, it's been kind of buried and destroyed like much of the Olmec uh, sites were. Um, and so there's a huge diffusion of these cultures spreading out through different parts of the world. And we're just gonna, I'm just going to skip through these last few, few slides because um, there's way too many here for the time we've got. So, um, I mean, basically, I think we're going to sort of round things up um, pretty shortly, but... One of the theories I like to do with what we've been discussing is the idea that in 3114 BC, there's the, these Quetzalcoatl people turned up on the Gulf Coast and they learned all this knowledge from wherever they came from. Some people say it was Atlantis, some people say it was other places. And something happened before that that caused this worldwide movement of uh, people moving around the planet. And, uh, and I think there was possibly a cataclysm. Edmund Marriage and some other researchers believe there was something happened in Austria in about 3200 BC, which would be just before this time the calendars began and the pyramids started getting built and the pharaonic age in Egypt started and the megalithic explosion happened. And so I suggest that these people were from this continent or from a you know they went around the world to sort of recalibrate and resurvey the planet to bring the arts and sciences back around the planet and these were some of the peoples that were doing that and they marked they deliberately marked that date 3114 bc because that's when it all was happening and so if they were marking something cataclysmic happening at the beginning of the calendar i don't know you know get too doom and gloom but perhaps they were marking something at the end of the calendar we need to take a look at and this is one of the reasons they were so obsessed with time um, and I've got a sort of strong sense that that might be the case and there's you know with all these Venus transits and these processional alignments all taking place um, there's cert certainly something to consider there I don't know if you've got anything to add to that um, where's, m where's my little slide with that like, writing on it oh that's, that's, <laughs> that's gone where, where was that I don't know should we look at? Well, we're gonna. Should we just go into? We're gonna go into some crop circles because I think uh, we've had enough of big stones uh, for the evening. Uh, because there's some theories that we've been sort of trying to deduce uh, from them, and Jeff's sort of got a whole load of new data. Uh, we're not sure. You know, obviously, there's a discussion if they're man-made or not. I, I watched this video on YouTube the other day that was convinced. Well, whoever made it was convinced that there's a connection between the Mayans and the crop circles and it was pretty vague it was made by someone called ufotv.com or something like that so it could uh, be pretty random but um i think as time's running out we'll jump into this segment now okay <clears throat> these are some of the best uh, examples of crop circles that have been associated with my calendars in 2012. Um, this one here in 1998 here near silbury hill there's 33 of these little uh flame light things and uh, so people were saying that there was an interesting story with this because um, they had the, the Dreamtime Festival in Glastonbury at the time and they were, they were trying to create a crop circle by imagining and it sort of seemed to fit in exactly it was uh, Luna Yaks can joy involved in it and this is what came up the very next day and they went they went there and just found it uh, and it because 20 plus 13 is 33 but 20 times 13 is 260 which is the sacred Zolkin calendar um, this one here, there are um, uh, 20 of the dots around the edge and 18 of these squiggles in the middle. 20 times 18 uh, is 360. One another major uh, cycle in the calendars. But this one is very convincing because uh, it's actually uh, identical to, uh, I just coloured it in to emphasise here, but that's identical to a diagram in uh, Jose Arguelles' Mime Factor. Except round this one, you've got a sort of orbit with a little planet on it. Uh, where is it? Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's just up here somewhere, as if it's just approaching, just approaching a little transition line there. Could be, you know, associating like a, an orbit of planet. Just a little uh, possibility. It's um, tying Earth into uh, to this 2012 thing here. Because that's exactly what this, this diagram is about, the 13 Baxen cycle from 3114 BC to 2012. Yeah. Uh, this one was a 20 by 20 grid, 400, which is 20 turns in one Katun, 20 Katuns in one Baxen, 400. This one here, 
there is a 26 by 30 grid, which is 780. Three Zolkins are, are 780 days, but it's also one Mars synodic cycle of 780 days. Uh, and I did find some lovely blown nodes in that one. This was an amazing one. Uh, they called it the Earth is Missing Formation because it seemed to be a diagram of the solar system but uh, with all the orbits of the inner planets and the asteroid belt but no Earth on its orbit. Sounded pretty ominous but then they realised that it was very similar to, this, to the state the solar system was in if you looked at it from below on the day that it appeared. Um, but they then sort of went forward looking from the standard position above the solar system and found it's also very similar to a, uh, a configuration um, that occurred a little bit later on and it turned out uh, a few years later when this configuration occurred that it was a very significant day because there was a, a, a solar storm which caused a geomagnetic storm which made the, the uh, northern lights come down to an unusual latitude showing uh, that this has got some uh, there's a um, oh no, I think I'm actually associating with some no, what it is, it's about, sorry, I'm confusing it with another one. It's about um, Venus. Basically, once you join all these dots up, it's, it's showing you that this is during a transit of Venus. And so uh, there's 65 of these in here as well. The whole thing is encoding Venus. Um, and the interesting thing about 2012 is that the Venus transit is something uh, that happens in 2012. Uh, and that ties in with this one because Venus does a little re retrograde loop every uh, 584 days and when you join up the loops it makes a pentagram and that so 584 times 5 is the same as 8 times 365 8 Maya halves is the same as 5 retrograde loops of Venus exactly and that's what really interests them and that's why they use the harb to track Venus but if you add up these little bits in between they come to 65 so that gives you because uh, it's 5 times 13 is 65 so that gives you the Venus number as well and then you've got the same thing in miniature in the middle so it could be a Venus transit cycle but it could also be um, a precessional cycle because 65 Bactons times 5 is uh, is 26,000 tons woo <laughs> so now uh, there was a uh, this formation appeared near Silbury Hill and a guy called C. Lewis started making all kinds of claims about it being to do with 2012 after the uh, Daily Mail newspaper or one of those new newspapers had it on the front and called it the Doomsday Formation. Why? Because it looked like it had Maya-like glyphs in it, that's the only reason. So C. Lewis came up with all these all this calculation to show how it encoded the, the date of uh, 21st December 2012 and everybody was really impressed and amazed but in fact he miscounted how many of these little things there were so the, the uh, theory fell to pieces but nobody cared <laughs> and then uh, then he s because I, I exposed him he changed his name to the Australian scientist which was the same name as a famous asteroid hoaxer uh, now I think I know who it is now but I'm not going to tell you oh, since we're being filmed who was it? I'll tell you and you tell <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, did, I didn't hear him. Sorry. Right. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, they also, they, uh, Jaime Masson said these two had to do with 2012. Uh, very vague sort of uh, people were getting excited, you see. Once we had those quite solid associations, people started saying every, you know, two years ago, Crop Circle Connector, somebody got on there and said every single Crop Circle was to do with 2012 and gave these ridiculous explanations, you know. Um, but, you know, you've seen the best ones. These ones are not so convincing. Uh, go on to the next one. This is, this is the really convincing one, the next, the next picture. Oh, dear, it's broken. Can you click on that? Yeah, it's not alert, doing that. Oh, oh we've got the, the whirling beach ball from hell. There you go. Right. Uh, 15th of July 2008, at Avebury, we had a, a diagram of the solar system showing the inner planets, the sun, the outer planets. And when the people got their astronomical software out, they could see that it was actually the closest thing it was, was uh, actually the 23rd of December 2012. 
except uh, Pluto was in completely the wrong position. It was about 30 degrees off, although, of course, by then Pluto had been demoted, so it's not really a planet anymore. So some people are suggesting, well, perhaps it isn't Pluto, perhaps it's an asteroid. You know, perhaps this is something we haven't, you know, it's Nibiru, oh my God, etc. Not that I think it is, but uh, it's still pretty uh, a, a nice formation. The, um, the uh, farmer chopped it out shortly after that. Um, but what does it mean, though? Um, these, these weird glyphs came up next to it that nobody has ever deciphered, which uh, aren't on there because they were just out of shot. Okay. Never mind. I think that we're kind of uh, pr pretty much coming to a close here because it is probably midnight or, or so. So, um, um, I mean, obviously, there's so much speculation with 2012. I mean, if you really want to get deeply into it, you've really got to read Jeff's books, Beyond 2012 and uh, 2012 in Your Pocket, which are available at the back. Uh, and uh, so are some of my stuff as well. But, um, you know, it could just be this. This could just actually be what it was all about. But really, you know, what do, what do uh, we know about calendars? <laughs> That's the Maya response to that last one. <laughs> okay, I think, we, I think we've had enough and you've probably had enough. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>